As you drive along the highways and back roads of the Northern Neck, you'll pass many churches, landmarks that extend back in time and that help us to tell the history of the region. Some churches, even those with more modern buildings, are quite old. In some cases, the buildings themselves are old, having survived wars, fires, and violent weather. The stories told by these churches are the story of the Northern Neck, some going back to the 17th century when Virginia was an English colony. They tell the story of generations of families that were born here, lived here, died here. Of all the Northern Neck's institutions, its churches are perhaps its oldest and most enduring. Their history is worth preserving and remembering. Time doesn't permit us to show all, but these are some of the historic churches of Virginia's Northern Neck. Though it's not the oldest church building in the Northern Neck, Christ Church, outside Irvington, is one of the best known. Finished in 1735, Christ Church was the most finely crafted Anglican parish church in all of colonial Virginia. This is the second church that was on this site. The first church was completed in 1670 by John Carter. In 1730, his son, Robert King Carter, Virginia's wealthiest tobacco planter at the time, offered to build a new brick church here at his own cost and charges, which the vestry of Christ Church Parish accepted. And we think work began soon after 1730. It took about five years to build this extraordinary structure. Lots of different hands went into its creation. We know there were enslaved workers here, there were indentured servants, and there were also free craftsmen who all undertook different tasks such as carpentry, blacksmithing, brick making, brick laying, joinery, plaster work. Uh, one of the beauties of the building is it looks just like it did in 1735. So it's really a time capsule when you walk into this building. No longer used regularly as a house of worship, Christ Church remains an active cultural force in the region, drawing thousands of visitors. Christ Church has many stories to tell, and people come here for all kinds of reasons. Some people are lovers of great architecture, and you certainly will not be disappointed in looking at this stunning building. And we, we often tend to walk right into a building. We want to get right into it and see the inside, but the outside is just as important as the inside with its incredible brickwork and its entablature and these these great designs that these many craftsmen put together here. The Northern Neck's oldest churches are almost all Episcopal since they began as Anglican, the established Church of England. The proliferation of religious denominations that followed would have to wait until after the Revolution. And as part of the established Church of England, Christ Church was a quasi-governmental institution all residents of the parish were taxed by the church. Attendance was required at least once a month. Government proclamations were read from the pulpit. It was also a church reflecting a highly regimented society, and that's reflected in the architecture. And as you see in the, the arrangement of the pews, the seating assignments, also the arrangement of the pulpit, this triple-decker pulpit where you have government announcements. Church and state could not be any clearer as you listen to a proclamation from Governor William Gooch in the 1740s. Um, so all these things kind of are revealed through the architecture and that space in the building. It really is a vision of, of Virginians' very ordered hierarchical community. Yokomico Church on Old Yokomico Church Road in Westmoreland County is not only the oldest church building in the Northern Neck, it is said to be the fifth oldest in Virginia and the ninth oldest in America. Built in 1706, this beautiful brick structure replaced the original wood frame church built sometime around 1655. 
It, of course, was part of the Church of England, built by emigrants from England and Scotland, who constructed this church without the aid of plans or blueprints. And they built a church based on their memory what a countryside church in Scotland they visualized. And so they built this with, like I say, without any blueprints. And it's interesting that it's a rectangle, but it's not, a, it's not an exact rectangle. One wall is longer, wider, than another wall. Part of Copal Parish, Yokamako Church drew worshipers from the surrounding area, including George Washington, who, as an infant, was very likely baptized here. Because his mother's guardian was the warden in 1732 uh, of Copal Parish, it is highly likely that he was baptized using the baptismal font that we still have. After America gained its independence, Yokamako Church, along with other buildings housing the Church of England, fell into disrepair. It was rescued by a soldier from New Jersey after the War of 1812. Well, fortunately, he fell in love with the girl down the, down the road. And he came back in 1816 and he married her. And he and his father-in-law spent, at their own expense, from 1816 to about 1830, bringing this church back to life. The church today looks very much as it did in 1865, when it once again became the home of an active Episcopal congregation. The church porch, a medieval feature of English churches, provided a proper place for preliminary blessings performed before entering the sanctuary. The wicked doors date to at least 1706 and are 8 feet tall, 6 feet wide, and weigh 2,000 pounds. Like many of the Northern Neck's ancient churches, the churchyard surrounding the building is mostly devoid of tombstones. The original wooden markers disintegrated years ago. However, it remains hallowed ground. In the 1990s, it was determined that there are about a hundred skeletal remains in this area of the churchyard. And those individuals are known only to the master. But because of that, uh, and the likelihood that there are other skeletal remains throughout this area, no one will ever be buried in the churchyard. Since 1655, there has been a church on or near this site on the banks of Nominai Creek in Westmoreland County. The first church was built on the opposite side of the creek, but in 1704, a church was built here on land donated by Ewell Watkins, who asked that the church be built over the family burial plot. George Washington attended church here twice in 1768. That church lasted until the War of 1812. British Admiral Cockburn, known as the Ruffian, and who would later put a torch to the Capitol and the White House, burned Nominai Church to the ground and stole the silver. This structure, a simple stone building, was built around 1852 and today is still used for periodic services by Copal Parish. In 1669, a wealthy Lancaster landowner named David Fox bequeathed money, and probably land, for the building of a new church in the county along River Road, south of Lively. The result was St. Mary's Whitechapel Church, now St. Mary's Whitechapel Episcopal Church. Uh, also in his will, he left uh, instructions that a chalice be prepared in London and sent here and we have that chalice still in the, the church uh, property. The name Whitechapel and St. Mary's uh, 
was at the request of David Fox, the gentleman who gave the original property here, he asked that the church be named after his family parish in London, which was St. Mary's in the Whitechapel district of London. The Fox family continued to be strong supporters of the church. David Fox's two sons made substantial gifts, including wooden panels made in London, bearing the words of the Ten Commandments, the Lord's Prayer, and the Creed, all of which are still in the church hundreds of years later. And William Fox also ordered a font uh, to be made in London and sent over here. We also have that here in the church. Uh, luckily, in many respects, it was carved from a single piece of stone and is very, very heavy and in, we believe has never really left the church. The church membership grew to the point it had to be expanded. In the 18th century, two wings were added to the original rectangular building, forming a cruciform. Inside, there were three galleries, one of which, the South Gallery, survives today. Largely abandoned for decades, the building that once symbolized England's power in the colonies was used as a stable and other mundane purposes. In 1832, it was reclaimed as a church by an Episcopal parish and has continued ever since. Not surprising for a church this old, Whitechapel's churchyard is large, with graves spanning the centuries. The oldest is John Stretchley, a county clerk and merchant, who was buried in 1698. Other notable graves include State Senator Robert O. Norris, several members of the Ball family, and Academy Award-nominated actress Margaret Sullivan. Wicomico Parish Church may have provided the name for the Northumberland County village in which it stands. The parish dates back to 1649, with the first building, a small frame structure that was replaced in the 1760s by a much larger brick structure along the lines of Christ Church in Lancaster County. This massive building measured 75 feet long and 35 feet wide, with walls that were three feet thick, an arched ceiling, and three galleries supported by turned and fluted columns. The building fell into disrepair after the Revolutionary War and disestablishment of the Church of England and was demolished in 1840. Later in the 19th century, the third and present church building was constructed on the same site. Some of the stones from the original building can be found in the churchyard today. The present church building contains examples of incredible workmanship, both inside and out. Over the centuries, families that have worshipped here include the Lees, Gaskins, Balls, and Haney's. North Farnham is the parish formed in 1683 when Farnham Parish was divided into North and South Farnham nine years before Rappahannock County was divided into Richmond and Essex counties. The North Farnham Church was not erected until 1737, however, just off Historyland Highway between Lively and Warsaw. Like most Anglican churches after the Revolution, it was largely abandoned. A skirmish was fought in the churchyard during the War of 1812, when the building was used not as a church, but as a stable for horses. Slowly, the church re-emerged as a vibrant force in the 19th century. A serious fire in 1887 nearly destroyed it, leaving only the walls standing. The restoration took decades and was finally finished in 1921. St. Stephen's Episcopal Church is on Northumberland Highway in the village of Heathsville. The building was consecrated in 1881, but its roots go all the way back to the Church of England. St. Stephen's Church is probably in Heathsville is probably one of the older churches in the Northern Lake. It was established by combining two parishes in 1698, I believe, and. Uh, this, this Gothic style, which goes back to the early 1880s, makes it a very distinctive landmark in Heatsville.
The church is an example of the Gothic style adapted to a rural parish building in the late 19th century. The wood frame building is a rectangular, one-story gabled roof structure covered with board and batten siding. If you've driven through Warsaw, Virginia, you've driven past St. John's Church. The building was erected in 1834, but the church itself goes back to 1732 and replaced the original Anglican Lunenburg Parish Lower Church that was largely abandoned after the Revolutionary War. St. John's Church exemplifies the rebirth of the Episcopal Church in Virginia under the leadership of the Right Reverend Richard Channing Moore, elected second bishop in 1814. He inspired a new generation of clergy who helped rebuild other parish churches in the Northern Neck that had fallen into disrepair as Americans turned their back on all things British. Among those buried in St. John's Churchyard is 1st District Congressman William Atkinson Jones, who served in Congress from 1891 until his death in 1918. Citizens of the Philippines erected this memorial to Jones, honoring him for authoring the legislation that granted Philippine independence. By the mid-19th century, the churches that were largely abandoned after the Revolutionary War because of their British ties began to enjoy something of a revival. The congregation at Christ Church in Weems moved a few miles north and established a new church in Kilmarnock, Grace Church, later known as Grace Episcopal Church. Grace Episcopal Church was the very first church built in Kilmarnock in 1852. The original chapel still stands, and, and, and the original building still stands, and it was used as a chapel. The building itself is on the National Register of Historic Places. At that time, Grace Church, Historic Christ Church, St. Mary's White Chapel, and Trinity Church were all served by a single rector. Grace Church was eventually given independence and oversight of Historic Christ Church, and the other two congregations were able to call their own rector. Today, Grace Church maintains its ties to historic Christ Church. When the American colonies defeated England and won their independence, it brought about revolutionary change in all aspects of American life. And though it didn't happen immediately, the idea of an established church lost favor with the people. In 1786, Thomas Jefferson wrote the Virginia Statute for Religious Freedom, declaring that all men shall be free to express and by argument to maintain their opinion in matters of religion, thereby taking a sledgehammer to the concept of an established church and paving the way for the First Amendment to the Constitution. The thing to remember, too, is since the fourth century, there have been an established religion since Constantine. So Jefferson's statute, which is a beautiful document, it's incredibly poignant, the writing, but it's also a declaration of natural rights. And it's hard to appreciate just what that meant because he was overthrowing 1,400 years of a church establishment. One of, in Jefferson's notes on the state of Virginia, he said that the legitimate powers of government extend to such acts only as are injurious to others but it does me no injury for my neighbor to say there are 20 gods or no god. It neither picks my pocket nor breaks my leg. That's a radical thought in the 18th century. The disestablishment of the Anglican Church opened the way for other religious denominations whose members had only been barely tolerated during colonial times. Baptists, Methodists, and Presbyterians quickly established churches and attracted large numbers of members. Baptists in the Northern Neck didn't wait for the defeat of England to strike a blow for religious freedom, constituting Maratico Baptist Church in 1778. Known as the Mother Church of Baptist in the region, it would spawn a number of other Baptist churches over its long history. By the mid-19th century, the church membership had grown to nearly 1,000 people, creating the need for a larger building. The present church building outside Kilmarnock, reflecting the architectural style of the time, was built in 1856 using bricks that were made at the site. 
Colonel Addison Hall served as pastor for 35 years, and his daughter, Henrietta Hall Schruck, holds the distinction of being the first woman missionary to China from the United States. Soon after America gained its independence, other Protestant denominations in the Northern Neck gained their freedom as well. One of the first Methodist churches in the region was White Marsh Church, known as the Mother Church of Methodism in the Northern Neck. Established in 1792 at the site of Methodist camp meetings, the church attracted an eager congregation right away. George Washington was still the president, it, that, you know, just to put that into perspective. And they built a building here, not this building, the building that they built in 1792 is gone, and this building was built in 1848. The 1848 building still stands on Maryball Highway, just west of Kilmarnock. It thrived throughout the 20th century, but gradually lost members and was closed by the Methodist Church around 2003. It sat empty and unused for about 10 years before a group of people brought it back to life, making it an interdenominational church. We were able to come in and people were so generous in the community and within the congregation that it took us almost no time, I mean, it seemed like no time at all. We were able to pay cash to have somebody re um, plaster the walls and fix the ceiling. We did it in three stages. We raised enough money to do this part, and then we raised enough money to do that part <laughs> mm -hmm. so that we could do it um, debt-free because this little congregation couldn't handle having a debt. The present building has stood for more than a century and a half and today looks very much like it did when it was built serving as an example of the Georgian architectural style that was often used for churches. In Northumberland County near Lotsburg sits another old Baptist church, Cone Baptist, originally known as Wicomico Baptist Church. It goes back to 1804, with the first building, Cone Meeting House, built in 1811. As the church grew in the following years, the members undertook the ambitious project of constructing the present church building, dedicated in 1847. It was constructed in the federal architectural style and built using locally fired bricks, and the stone steps were imported from Baltimore, brought in on a sailing vessel to Barnes Wharf. One of Northumberland County's older Methodist churches sits at the intersection of Brown Store Road and Jesse Ball DuPont Highway in Wicomico Church. Wicomico Church United Methodist Church was founded in 1837 by Cyrus and Betty Harding, who were local farmers and merchants, and who built the first church and provided land for the current one. The present building was completed in 1859 and has a rich history. Um, it's also a pre-Civil War church, and soldiers um, were here, and they used upstairs as barracks. Uh, we even in the back had um, a hospital where they did surgeries. Um, each Sunday, there was not a Sunday that they did not worship in this church. Visitors to the church can see examples of rural 19th century architecture since there have been few modifications to the sanctuary over time. Um, the pews and the original floor, um, the walls, you know, not much has been changed. Uh, it's a lot that's still here um, in the church. So. And like many of the older churches in the region, the churchyard bears testament to its longevity and to the family names of generations of members. At the junction of Courthouse Road and Route 610 in Northumberland County lies another of the Northern Neck's historic churches, one in fact that holds a unique place in the county's history. Don't be fooled by the modern structure that sits on this hill. This church's roots go back to the end of the Civil War and the end of slavery. I believe that it was more than just the people who were a part of this church that needed this church in 1866. I believe that this church was birthed out of the divine intervening 
uh, nature of God, that black people and white people could come together around the whole essence of what it is that we believe that God needs in our community. The present church building is only the third structure in this church's 154-year history. Remarkably, the first building still stands across the road from the present church and remains a powerful link to the past. After holding initial services in a private home, First Baptist Church of Heathsville held services in a school built by Emily Howland of New York, who provided educational opportunities for local children, most of whom were part of families who belonged to the church. Many of Emily Howland's students later became teachers themselves, and some of their families are members of the church today. My great-grandmother was educated by Emily Howland, who built the school. But I did not know that as a child growing up. I learned that in later years. She was a teacher, my aunt was, a, her sister was a teacher, my great-grandmother was a teacher, and they all taught at one time or the other at Howland School. A permanent church building was constructed on the site of the present church in 1892. First Baptist Church used that building until 1941, when members erected the present building. Church member Helen Burnett, 102 years old at the time of this interview, remembers when the present building was constructed. She's wearing a mask because the interview took place during the COVID-19 pandemic. I've seen this church built. My father had a hand in helping to build this brick church which they started off with a wood church. But somewhere along the line, before they made a decision, they decided we want a brick church. The building required generous donations from local church members, as well as from members who had left the area and moved to urban areas, becoming very effective fundraisers. A lot of us left and went, left here and went to Baltimore and different cities. And the pastor came and asked us if we would continue to support the church. And that's what we did. Okay. In Baltimore, we had a club. We had one in Washington. Everybody we could grab, we didn't care if they ever seen this church. But we would bring them down here and they were carried away. They loved it. The end of the Civil War quickly led to the founding of a number of churches by African Americans as the newly freed population wanted churches of their own where they could enjoy the same religious freedom other Americans enjoyed. The original Old St. John's Baptist Church is believed to be the oldest African American Baptist Church in Lancaster County. In 1873, some of the members of the congregation of that church along with congregation members of other churches decide to build a new church at Mount Olive. The congregation in Mount Olive, by the way, is just outside of Wicomico Church. Before the people built a building, they actually were so eager to have a service, their very first service was held outside under a brush arbor. Old St. John's Baptist Church was located here, just off Harris Road between Kilmarnock and Whitestone. Beulah Baptist Church also was established soon after the Civil War in 1868. The original building still stands on Mary Ball Highway near Lively. As for St. John's Baptist Church, well, today there's new St. John's Baptist Church located on Main Street in Kilmarnock. The collapse of the Church of England in Virginia after the Revolutionary War not only opened the way for Protestants to build churches in the Northern Neck, it paved the way for Catholics as well. While Catholics were well represented across the Potomac River in Maryland, they were a small minority in this part of Virginia. But in the latter part of the 19th century, that began to change. And in Kilmarnock, Catholics established St. Francis de Sales Church. In 1875, a priest from Baltimore came down to uh, Kilmarnock to see if there would be enough interest in opening a Catholic church here in town. And he encountered a couple of families, including one with the Palmer family, which really helped to get the church going and underway. 
and eventually a uh, priest from Baltimore would come down on the steamboat and they would stay with the Palmer family. St. Francis Catholic Chapel at Kilmarnock was dedicated in 1885. It was described by Bishop John J. Keene as a small but neat frame structure built near the spot where three Dominican missionaries were martyred by Indians. Two late 19th century churches on Windmill Point Road in Whitestone were founded and the buildings constructed at about the same time and are practically across the road from one another. Maple Grove Baptist Church was formed, as most Baptist churches in the region were, as an outgrowth of Moratico Baptist Church and later Whitestone Baptist Church. The early history of the Maple Grove Church is a bit sketchy since there are few known records of those early years. The same is true for Asbury United Methodist Church just down the street, with the building typical of late 19th century church architecture. In a somewhat unusual move, the congregations of the two churches today often hold joint services. Wesley Evangelical Presbyterian Church in Weems is located a stone's throw from historic Christ Church, another example of religious freedom that might not have been tolerated when Virginia was a colony, bringing us full circle in our tour of historic churches. Wesley isn't as old as the other churches we've visited, but it's included because it is celebrating its centennial year in 2021. It is a community church in the truest sense, still with deep ties to its founding and the cultural history of the community. Um, as I mentioned, my roots are deep. My great-grandfather, Richard Rose, was part of building this church. He was a boat builder, and he lived just a mile um, from here. And if you look around the church, it is built similar to that of a boat. Um, that's the only way they knew how to build his house is the same way. He built his house and it's built um, the same as you would build a boat. Um, and with that being said, it's built, built very strong and it's lasted for almost 100 years. As Pastor Bill mentioned, yes, the, the wood was actually brought down from, I believe, uh, sharps and farther up. And it was brought to a landing at the end of the road and uh, brought on a horse and cart uh, and the history tells us that it was the younger boys, young boys, which of course would be, many of them would be gone now, uh, actually walked from the landing <clears throat> with the, on, you know, boards and things on their shoulders. And like many communities, the people not only built their own church, they raised the funds necessary to build it. Church records show that Wesley Presbyterian cost less than $300. From colonial times, through the revolution, through the Civil War, through good times and bad, the churches of the Northern Neck have persevered. Their legacy has sustained generation after generation. Regardless of your religious affiliation or whether you have an affiliation at all, Residents of the Northern Neck should take pride in the churches that have taken root in Northern Neck soil and flourished, sustaining the values that have enhanced a quality of life for centuries and will continue to do so far into the future.